a gracious good day to one and all. Tis I, Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico, and we'd like to welcome one and all to the How Weird World Fair today. And this is the start of it, so we shall begin with a proclamation. Greetings and salutations to our loyal subjects gathered before us here virtually online. Indeed, tis I, Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, the patron saint of Discordia, addressing you today in this 160th year of our magnificent reign and our 202nd year of existence. Firstly, we should like to express our gratitude to the organizers of the How Weird World Fair for requesting our regal presence here once again. I come before you today with a personal message from the Empire. Stay weird. There's a good reason that San Francisco is the seat of our empire. Here we cherish such values as individuality, compassion, empathy, charity, and reinvention. The phoenix, the firebird, is the symbol of our fair city not only because San Francisco has risen from the ashes many, many times, but also because this is a place where people can come to reinvent themselves. Indeed, even I, formerly a bankrupt merchant, was able to not only be reinvented as your sovereign, but celebrated and honored as such. This is not just a one-time occurrence, but doubtlessly the thread that weaves our beloved city together. Remember this. Cherish it. Celebrate it, as we do today. Spread it across the empire. Fight against normalcy. Stand up for individuality. To quote the late and great Dr. Hunter S. Thompson, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. We could not agree more. These are truly weird times we live in, and it is incumbent upon all of us to create a society where our values are triumphant and the forces of darkness banished to the rubbish bin of history. Therefore, be it resolved that we declare the How Weird World Fair open. And so we are here before you today discussing some of these, oh, shall we call them eccentrics from our city's past? Of which, of course, I am one of the foremost. So let's begin with a little bit about me. Why not? I was born Joshua Abraham Norton in London, England, on February 4th, 1818. When I was very young, my family emigrated to Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. And it was there that my father was in the ship chandlery business. He would sell ship riggings, that sort of thing. He was very successful at what he did. When he died, he left me an inheritance of $40,000, which in those days was a pretty fair amount of money. I come to San Francisco in 1849. But unlike others of that era, I do not seek my fortune. In the gold fields of the Sierra, I make my money by investing in real estate and commodities. In just four years, I increased that fortune to $250,000. $10 million today, but that great amount of money was not enough. I wanted more. So I hatched a scheme to corner the market on rice a scheme that I thought would not fail, but did very badly. I'm wiped out. I lose everything. I have to declare bankruptcy. Shamed, broken, forgotten. I disappear for a couple of years. No one knows where I went or what happened to me until the 17th of September, 1859, the day I walked into the offices of the San Francisco Daily Evening Bulletin newspaper hand the editor a proclamation. It reads, At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States. And in virtue of the authority, thereby in me vested, 
do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to gather in Music Hall of this city on the first day of February next. Then and there, to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which this country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. With that, I become Norton the First, Emperor of the United States, later to add the title Protector of Mexico. If I were to do that in any other city in the world, it would be dismissed as the rantings of a madman. But being that this is San Francisco, everybody here treated me as if I really were the emperor for the next 21 years. I was given this suitable uniform by the officers of the Presidio. I would eat for free in restaurants, had the best seats in the theater. On opening night, people would rise in my honor. The police salute me. Businesses clamor for my endorsement. I ride transit for free. I even print my own imperial treasury bonds. Oops, wrong side. There it is right there. They were accepted as legal tender whenever I presented them. I came up with ideas that people thought were a little strange at the time, but I was actually a great visionary. My ideas came true. Like building a bridge across the bay, starting the United Nations, abolishing Congress, the Supreme Court, the Presidency, and the Democratic and Republican parties. Maybe not such a bad idea. Also banned the use of a certain dirty word. Still punishable by a $25 fine. I don't want to hear any of you ever say it. And that word is Frisco. Please don't say it. I have a long and a prosperous reign of 21 years. I stick for the rights of the Chinese, African Americans, women. I'm a great thinker and come up with many, many ideas. But as is inevitable, I pass away on January 8, 1880. I am but a specter back before you today. They have the biggest funeral the city has ever seen to this day. And there are people who still celebrate my existence, so uh, go on that, whatever that spider web thing is that you people use. I, I think I'm utilizing it today, as far as I know. Anyway, search out a little bit more information about me. You can certainly find out more about me on my website, EmperorNortonTour.com. Well, enough about me, or is it ever really enough about me? We will be coming back to some of my exploits uh, throughout our little talk today. But uh, let's begin with one of the more notable eccentrics. We're going to be talking about a lot of them. Uh, this man is known as George Washington II. And let me show you a photograph of him. We have a number of photographs to show you today. This is him right here. Not the bust of George Washington, but George Washington II with the epaulets. Um, he actually believed himself to be a direct descendant of George Washington, even though George and Martha had no direct descendants. And his real name was Frederick Combs, uh, also sometimes known as Willie Combs. And he lived here in the 19th century, about the same time as I did. We were actually great rivals, and I once uh, banished him from the city, and he had to leave. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, he was born in New York City, as near as we can tell, in 1803, and was a phrenologist by trade. Now, that is the somewhat quackery uh, medical science where bumps in the head, shape of the head, determine someone's personality. That has since been thoroughly debunked, although there are some people that still hold on to it. He was also a photographer, possibly a marriage broker. He passed himself off as the great matrimonial candidate once here in San Francisco. Um, he said that his features were very similar to George Washington's. Published at least one book on the uh, subject of phrenology in 1841. He arrives in the West Coast sometime in the 1850s. Uh, first appearance here, they think, is 1863. And he was often known as Professor Freddie Combs before he uh, assumed the title of George Washington II. He wore a Continental Army uniform, tanned buckskin, 
and um, spent his while planning campaigns for the Revolutionary War, which of course was long over. Uh, during the day, he would be seen walking up and down Montgomery Street, wearing his powdered wig, his tricorner hat, and the banner proclaiming himself as the great matrimonial candidate. Uh, we crossed paths many times, as I said, and he was actually uh, satirized by a lithographer by the name of Edward Jump, who also did a number of portraits of me. Let me see if I can find... Here it is right here. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, it's not the best version of this photograph, or this lithograph, but as you can see, well, let's see, here am I. Oops, everything's opposite. Okay, here am I, and here is George Washington II with his banner. Oops, there we go. Well, you get the idea right there. There he is. Uh, Edward Jump had a lot of success. We'll be returning to his works a little bit later on, if I can figure out how all this opposite stuff works. Uh, he left the city when I told him to leave, because I saw him as a rival. Arriving in New York in 1868, he was discovered there by none other than Mark Twain, who also wrote about me on a number of occasions. Uh, you may know him better as Samuel Clemens. Uh, still believe that he had charming effects on the ladies. Uh, he would eventually die in New York City in 1874. If you were to go to the Palace Hotel, the Pied Piper Restaurant, which is just beyond the bar, there is a very beautiful mural in there that depicts both of us, as well as a number of other San Francisco eccentrics, some of whom we will be talking about. But next, we will move on to one of the more interesting people, I think. One of the more interesting eccentrics. And his name was Oofty Goofty, the Wild Man of Borneo. Now, he was a rather fascinating figure. He was born Leonard Borschudt, or Burkhardt, in Berlin in 1862. Uh, in 1900, he told the Houston Daily that he came to the U.S. on the SS Frisia as a stowaway in 1876. Who knows? Uh, penniless. He uh, was five foot four, brown eyes, black hair, dark complexion. And he would uh, was known as the Wild Man of Borneo. He was featured in uh, shows, uh, eating raw meat. They, they tried to put fur on him at one point to make him look more wild. Uh, and it got stuck to his skin and it required turpentine to take it off and putting him on a roof, and um, it left him impervious to pain. Now, in his act, the way he got his name was when people would toss the raw meat to him, he would yell, Oofty Goofty! Oofty Goofty! Um, so he left, it left him impervious to pain. He still needed to earn a living. So he came up with the idea that people could strike him with their fist, with a billiard cue, anything. He could not feel it. Uh, but he later injured himself. Uh, some say trying to escape the husband of his lover at the time, a woman named Big Bertha, who also appeared in a production of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, let's pull up some pictures of them. Here we go. First of all, here is... Oops, that's interesting. That? Okay, we won't even deal with that. Okay, so here is Oofty Goofty himself. Here we go this way. Very strong man, as you can see. And then uh, this is his uh, lover, uh, Big Bertha. Quite an attractive woman, wasn't she? Yes. Um, he began to trek across the United States in 1886. Uh, he was knocked into a creek in Pinole in 1886. And 1899, he took, a, uh, took part in a go-as-you-please walking match in California and walked 223 miles in six days. Uh, the play Romeo and Juliet that he and Big Bertha appeared in was a, not a success. He would later live in Montana, uh, claiming that he'd become partially petrified. Now, I don't know if that means he became just stiff or if he was scared. We don't know. Mm. 
Uh, later, he lived in Texas, sold imitation diamonds, and performed odd feats for money. Uh, he was living in a hotel in Houston, Texas in the 1900s, and would appear again in the 1920 census, same hotel, and eventually uh, would be in the city directory in 1923, and was known to be 61 at that time. Interesting figure. Look more into him, definitely. Uh, the next one would be the Great Unknown, a man of mystery. His real name was Friedrich Wilhelm Fromm, born on August 27, 1833, in Russia. Uh, his hook, his uh, way to fame, was his huge, luxurious hair, which I'll show you in a moment, and also uh, his impeccable dress. He was always dressed to the nines. Let me, let me show you the picture of him here. It's uh, not a very good one, unfortunately, but it's all I could get. It's rather small, but we'll hold it close so you can see it. Here we go. This No, this way. There he is. Uh, this is an, a San Francisco Chronicle newspaper article from 1871, July 19. And although I'd always read that he did not speak, uh, it had a rather interesting interview with him uh, in which he would say, um, where's the quote here? He gave a bit about his background, but also very evasive answers. Unfortunately, the newspaper clipping did not about him did not print out particularly well, but um, it is available. He was giving a lecture and was interviewed by the Chronicle, had some few bad things to say about the call, an interview they had done with him. Uh, later, the reporter who interviewed him had an appointment to show up at his house, and although they could hear someone walking around inside, he never, ever uh, emerged. He actually lived on DuPont, now Grant Avenue, uh, on Sacramento Street. Oh, sorry, on DuPont, between Sacramento and California. Actually, not far from where I was living, because I was living in the Eureka Lodgings, which is on Commercial Street, between Kearney and Montgomery. So we lived a couple blocks apart. It's uh, probably a good chance that we met, but it was so long ago, I simply don't remember. Uh, let me see, I think I have another picture here. Yes, well, here he is uh, pictured at, I need to find him on here, at the funeral for Bummer and Lazarus, who we'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, let's see, that would be Combs, no, not Combs, I'm sorry, the great unknown right there, the man with the top hat. Uh, there I am, dressed as the Pope, whoops, sorry, presiding over the funeral with a child swinging a rat, and who's the grave digger? My rival, George Washington II. So, uh, and here's Bummer, the dog, there he is, and Lazarus being taken to his grave by two, uh, two individuals. So, Bummer and Lazarus, uh, rather interesting dogs, not people, from our city's background, and um, here's a book about them. San Francisco, Bummer and Lazarus, San Francisco's Famous Dogs by Malcolm E. Barker. Yes, indeed. Barker wrote a book about dogs. Where else but in San Francisco? Excuse me for just one moment. Our music seems to have cut out. That's not proper. There we go. And we're back with the music once again. Um, they were two dogs. Bummer was the first to appear. They lived here in the 1860s. He was in Newfoundland. They were both mutts. And one day he saw a dog being attacked by a bunch of other dogs and chased the other dogs off and uh, would nurse the dog back to health, and that was Lazarus. They became inseparable friends. Uh, they were beloved for their antics and their heroics. They once stopped a runaway stagecoach. Uh, they were an, had a special talent for catching rats. So the merchants of Montgomery Street really liked Bummer and Lazarus. But the city at that time was also overrun with wild dogs biting people. Sporters supervisors had to take action. Uh, they said that any unclaimed or unmuzzled dogs had to be destroyed, included were Bummer and Lazarus. Merchants of Montgomery Street protested, and the board of supervisors passed a second law exempting Bummer and Lazarus from the first law, making them the wards of the people, thereby sparing their lives. Many associate the dogs with me. They may have followed me around, but it's been pretty well established in Barker's book that they were indeed not my dogs. So uh, if somebody tells you that, you need to correct them. 
I would definitely read that book by Malcolm Barker. It's a great uh, uh, book on the subject. Now, it was originally thought, we know this much, well, let me backtrack a little bit, that Bummer and Lazarus had burned up in the Great Earthquake and Fire of 1906. They both died in the 1860s, hence the uh, lithograph of their funeral. Uh, Lazarus first, followed a few years later by Bummer. They were taxidermied, and they were in a bar at 425 uh, Sansom Street, and it was assumed that they burned up. But Barker found some articles later on that shows that about, well, in February of 1906, just a couple months before the Great Earthquake, they were donated to the Golden Gate Park Museum. And now we know that as the de Young. And then another article from 1910 said that they were being sent out to be restuffed, and they would then be placed in the natural history uh, section of the uh, Golden Gate Park Museum. Uh, that's where the trail went cold. Uh, I picked it up a few years ago and the, had the DeYoung Museum go through their records for uh, the 18, 1860s and uh, actually 1910, pardon me. Only they discovered that when they were sent to be retaxidermied, they were filled with bugs, had to be destroyed. It was rather hoping to find them. Uh, a few other eccentrics to talk about from this time. Let me just make sure I don't have any other photos to show you from this. No. Well, here's an interesting one. This one's called Earthquakey Times by Edward Jump as well. And you can see Bummer right there as well. Well, we need to move on because we don't have much time left. I hope we can get through everybody. Uh, the Gutter Snipe is another interesting one. He was a very short, disheveled man, never changed his clothes, never spoke to anyone, would only eat food if you tossed it into the gutter, hence his name. And when he died, it was found that he was a great miser, sitting atop a fortune. Uh, speaking of fortunes, another one was the Money King. He was a money lender, the Fat Boy. He was noted for his girth, and another one was a quack peddler known as the King of Pain. I think the police wrote a song about him. And Old Crisis, a defrocked minister. Now let's get into more contemporary, because this, of course, has always been a city for eccentrics. And we still have them with us today. Hello. But we'll get to some of the ones that are still with us as well. Uh, Carol Dota, rather interesting figure from our city's history. You've ever been by the Condor Club? That's where she uh, danced, both topless and bottomless. She is credited with inventing both of those. Topless in 1964, bottomless in 1969. Uh, yet another, uh, you may have seen him walking around downtown, Frank Chu. Uh, he shows up at all sorts of events, walking around with this sign. Here's a picture of him. We run into him quite often. I hope he's doing well. And if you ever talk to him, he will talk about a theory that he has about 12 galaxies and how they owe him some money for using his image uh, without his authorization. Uh, real interesting guy. Stop and talk to him sometime. There was even a bar named after his uh, theory called 12 Galaxies, and he would drink there for free. And we, as I said, still see him walking the streets of San Francisco to this day, and hope to see him again very, very soon. Uh, another one would be the Automatic Human Jukebox. Those of you who were here in the 1970s may remember this gentleman. He would generally set up around Ghirardelli Square, Fisherman's Wharf, the cannery. Here's a picture of him meeting uh, Mayor George Moscone. And his jukebox was recently recovered from the trash and is now in storage. They hope to exhibit it someday. He played trumpet. You would put a few coins or maybe a dollar bill into the jukebox and the door would open up and he would play his trumpet. Uh, his real name was Grimes Poznikov, and he was a fixture in the 70s and 80s at Fisherman's Wharf. Um, he was a school teacher at one point in Chicago. He was arrested during the 1968 riots at the Democratic Convention. Uh, came to San Francisco eventually, started in 19, uh, 1970s. He earned about $60 a week for performing two hours a day. Um, they tried to get rid of music vendors in the Fisherman's Wharf area at one point, but he protested. It was put to the voters, and they decided to keep them. 
He was featured on Charles Kuralt's On the Road, The Mike Douglas Show, To Tell the Truth, Newsweek Magazine, The Wall Street Journal. Uh, he was arrested on a number of occasions for selling marijuana and uh, would eventually um, had to leave the spot because he played his music louder than the 13 decibel unit uh, allowance. Um, his teeth were knocked out by police during his last arrest in the 1980s. He became homeless, uh, was eventually uh, died on October 22nd, 2005, on a sidewalk near Cesar Chavez in the Bayshore Freeway of alcohol poisoning. Very, very sad that we lost such a wonderful individual as that, but uh, investigate him some more. He's rather interesting. Now, two of my favorites, the Brown Twins. Uh, they were, let's see, Marion and Vivian Brown. And they were the world's most identical twins. As you can see, they actually won a contest at one point for being the world's most identical twins. They lived together their entire lives. Uh, they were always dressed identically, always. And they were very flamboyant dressers. You can see the leopard skin coat in that photograph. Uh, they were always looking for bargains. Um, let's see. Now, Marion... No, Vivian died first in 2013. Marion in November 2014. They are in a niche together at the Columbarium in the Richmond District in, of course, matching urns. I've been there to see that. Uh, if you've never been to the Columbarium, by the way, it's fascinating, and that would require a half hour just to talk about alone, so we're not going to deal with that today, but uh, definitely maybe in, a, maybe in a future vlog or whatever, um, we'll be talking to you about that. Maybe not an eccentric, but definitely a beloved figure would be Tom Sweeney, the doorman of the Sir Francis Drake, who recently retired after 40 years on the job. There he is. His retirement was just recent. I would not classify him necessarily as an eccentric, but definitely someone who um, is, was very, and still is, very beloved in San Francisco. Tom, I hope you're having a great retirement. Uh, how about the Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill? As long as we featured Bummer and Lazarus, why not them? We don't know where these cherry-headed conyers came from, but here's Mark uh, Bittner, the gentleman who took care of them in the beginning, wrote the book about them, and of course stars in the documentary, uh, na same name as the book, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. Uh, they are definitely a fixture in the city, and uh, you've never been down to Sue Beerman Park, down by Embarcadero Center, around dusk. They like to inhabit the poplar trees there. It's quite a cacophony. How about the Bushman? You ever been to Fisherman's Wharf? Maybe you've been scared by this guy. Actually, the Bushman's a number of people. Uh, David Johnson was one. Gregory Jacobs died in 2014. We still see various Bushmen around the Fisherman's Wharf area. Or now, how about the world's rudest waiter? Edsel Ford Fong. Now, Sam Wo Restaurant is back, but that's their original location. Now they're on Clay and Kearney. It was never actually a building. It was sort of built between two buildings. He was known to be extremely rude. He would insult you, make you clean up dishes. People went there to be abused by him. There's actually a Chinese food restaurant at Oracle Park named Edsel Ford Fong. Uh, perhaps if you've never, if you've walked by it, rather, and seen that and wondered who could that be, well, now you know. And another eccentric from our city's past, the King of Torts, Melvin Belli, who had an office on Montgomery Street between uh, Washington and Jackson. Fascinating man, the, uh, really the first celebrity lawyer, quite flamboyant. If you walked by his public office, which faced out on the street, he had a collection there of one of everything, basically. And um, he had a skeleton that said it was a client who hadn't paid his bill. Flew a pirate flag from his building. Whenever he won a case, shot off a cannon. Uh, he actually was in an episode of Star Trek, season three, and the children shall lead them. Here's, here he is in his role on that. Not a very good actor, I have to say, but nonetheless, 
one of our great eccentrics. Well, we've only had about 30 minutes to talk to you today and have really just scratched the surface. So this may become a longer lecture at some point. Uh, we welcome you, of course, to take our tours, Amber Norton's fantastic San Francisco time machine. We also have, oops, the Countess, no, wait, she's right there, Oop, this side. Okay, there she is, the Countess Lola Montez. There she is, who does her Drag Me Along tour. And we are doing a daily vlog on the YouTube, also available on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, called Emperor Norton's Fantastic History Vlog. So check that out sometime. And it looks like we have run out of time for the day. So, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Everyone enjoy the How Weird, virtually. Stay safe. Stay inside. If you go outside, Wear a mask. Be kind to each other. Please be kind to each other. Stay weird. And on behalf of the Empire, a gracious good afternoon. <laughs>